Hey guys, thanks so much for clicking on this video. My name is Chris. Netflix has finally released the latest film in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. And this time around, we have yet again another new timeline set up for good old Leatherface, following him nearly 50 years later since the events of the first movie where a new group of influencers have invaded his town ready to bring new life to it, only to accidentally unearth Leatherface and put him on a rampage to get rid of them all. That's all pretty much it. Without giving me spoilers to you guys, this will be be a spoiler free review. So when it comes to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Leatherface, he's a character I was always fascinated with. Not only because, well, I am in Texas, but there was always so many unexplored aspects about good old Leatherface that I felt like they rarely ever really touched upon. I'll mention some of those aspects later on in this video, and while he's had several movies, I really only find myself liking a handful of them. That first one, of course, was iconic and ahead of its time. I know some people still find it kind of hard to watch today, but I think it still holds up. Nevertheless, my favorite entries in the franchise came in 2003 and in 2006 with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Begins like those are the peak of the franchise if you don't want to watch the nine ten different movie he has you watch these two and you're set you've seen everything you need to from Leatherface being a horror fan I'm always down to see a new incarnation and how they kind of update Leatherface for the modern age and he can be reintroduced to a new generation so they can carry on the chainsaw and keep it going but man were there a lot of behind the scene issues going on with this one yeah you had Feld Alvarez there to produce it, a very talented horror director who brought us Don't Breathe and the Evil Dead remake, lending a hand to the story so you would think there's a hint of greatness in here, but then two weeks into production they fire a director and then replace him with a new one, and then it was supposed to go to theaters, but then they decided, yeah, we don't want to do that, let's sell it to Netflix and see what we can earn. Some people might want to blame the pandemic for that, but I mean, when you had movies like Halloween Kills and Scream, both perform really well at the box office it should let you know if you have a good movie on your hands you release it in theaters because horror does well even in the pandemic especially if it's a horror icon that people recognize and has been around for years so then you finally sit down and watch this movie and see okay why did they dump it on netflix I see why they dumped it on Netflix. Let me start off with some of the positives because there was actually a lot to enjoy that I wasn't expecting here. For one, who knows how the original movie would have turned out with the first directors they had, but I gotta admit, David Blue Garcia actually did some crafty fun things in this Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. It's pretty well directed, at least when it comes to style and the handling of the kills in this movie. It doesn't necessarily come off cheap or like they're just going ahead and tossing bodies left and right because it's a horror movie. You expect people to die. The way this director has framed up and set up some of the kills that happened in this movie I was quite impressed with and wasn't expecting to get that level of attention and uniqueness because that's the biggest praise this Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie can get is Leatherface and the kills in here gnarly as hell like they are really cool like right off the bat with the very first skill that Leatherface does in this movie I was like oh I'm in for a treat. And at the end of the day, that's all some people are going to want from this franchise is just for them to kind of respect the character of Leatherface and give them some kills that kind of interest them or keep their attention for an hour and a half. Over the years, getting older and watching some of these silent serial killers do their thing, you start to pay attention a little more to the body language. I used to think back in the day, it didn't matter who played Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, or even Leatherface. Just make sure they're the right body shape and height, but it goes a long way when their body language can match the intensity on screen and Mark Berman the guy who plays Leatherface in this movie does a pretty damn good job you feel the presence of his Leatherface you're scared when he pops up on screen and you know if a character's left alone in a room with this guy they're probably not making it out alive. And I feel like that's a harder art form to get right nowadays, is just that presence of the silent killer. And I can see even really hardcore fans of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre kind of ending up pleased with this one. Maybe not extremely happy or overwhelmed, but enough where you're like, okay, I, I like this. That might be the bias we have, because I know whenever they come out with a Child's Play movie, a Freddy Krueger movie, a Scream movie, I'm always going to try and lean as hard as I can on the positives, because it's like, I love these characters, and I want this to be a good movie. And the team in here did a lot to throw in Easter eggs to the previous installments of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A lot of his famous moves and weapons that he uses in here, callbacks to things only Texas Chainsaw Massacre fans will remember, and that'll really be fun for them to explore and be like, all right, they, they did care about this guy. But what when it comes to story and substance or any passion being thrown into this movie, it's just severely lacking. I mean, just that plot alone is going to make people's eyes roll 
influencers who buy a town to try and gentrify it. The way this movie sets up the motives for Leatherface in this film are just kind of cringeworthy, kind of like so forced. You barely like these leads that you're following and who knows if you were even supposed to in the beginning. I always hate this trope in horror movies when the person who's about to get slashed by Leatherface or any other killer, the movie kind of has to make you dislike that person so you feel like they earned that knife to the chest or that stab to the back from the chainsaw. And this movie kind of does that for every single human being that pops up in this movie. They give you a reason not to like them, why they might come off as crappy people and why you should kind of cheer on Leatherface slashing them up when I'm like, go the opposite route, man. Make me care about this person. Make me feel like they shouldn't get it. This movie also begs the question, have we reached our limit to what is capable or what we can do with Leatherface? We just gotta set him in a deserted Texas town where it's hot. People come in, he'll grab a chainsaw, he'll wipe them out. At least the things that were fascinating in the 2003 and 2006 movie that I love so much is they introduced the element of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre having a family and them kind of being just as bad as Leatherface, don't even get me started on the amazing performance by R. Lee Emery. Because it feels like this movie wants to add some social commentary, elevate itself a little bit, commentate on what it means to gentrify a town, kick people out of it, plus the backstory behind one of the main characters and what it means to be a survivor. I won't spoil the backstory involved with her, but man, did the movie really think they were doing something by giving her that type of backstory. And I know some people might be like, Chris, this is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He puts on faces, he grabs his chainsaw, and then he silently goes ahead and takes down people. There's nothing more really to him when it's like, yeah, there is. They're just afraid to tackle it for some reason. Even in this movie, they tackle that side of Leatherface that we have seen a lot in all the other films that for some reason, we just don't explore. And that is the deeper psychology with Leatherface on why he wants to wear women's faces, put on makeup, women clothing. I know if they ever actually made a movie actually addressing that side of Leatherface, the woke community would go crazy. But I mean, it's something that's been with the character even when you change up his timeline. I think that would be a fascinating aspect of Leatherface to explore and figure out is some of that repressed anger the reason he's going ahead and slashing? But no, instead it's people came to my town, people bad, people need to be slashed. But probably the nail on the coffin that really made this movie step down and not even be its own thing was it really trying to do the Halloween 2018 thing of bringing back a legacy character, the survivor of the first film, Sally, which really isn't a spoiler, she's in the trailers, to confront Leatherface for the events that happened to her all these years ago because she has held the grudge and has been waiting for the day to get back at him. Oh man, was I so disappointed with the way they handled that storyline and also like, why would you even do that? Tell me if I'm wrong, Texas Chainsaw Massacre fans, but I feel like the character of Sally just happened to be the survivor in the first movie. No offense to the actress or even that character, but it's like she wasn't anyone memorable that when you think about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you go, man, that character of Sally, I loved her personality. I loved her backstory. When Jamie Lee Curtis, on the other hand, in the Halloween franchise, she has had major impact and is very much associated with Michael Myers. Heck, even history has shown that if Jamie Lee Curtis pops up in a Halloween movie, that film will end up making more money at the box office and people will go see it because there's actually an attachment there with those two characters facing off. There is no attachment or character in the world about these two characters facing off or coming back at each other. And it feels like the movie even knows that with them not even really playing it up or making it grand. By the end of the movie, I kind of understood what they were going for with bringing her in. It wasn't necessarily to be the legacy character to face off against Leatherface again. It was just so that this character had that connection with the other new main character of being a survivor and how a survivor should tackle their trauma. But at the end of the day with this movie, look, I have actually seen worse in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's franchise franchise, this was actually watchable and those kills in Leatherface himself were awesome. I think that's enough of a redeeming factor for you to show this movie to a horror or Texas Chainsaw fan. I just don't know if this one reaches the level of fun trash because the characters and the story around it are just so irritating and uneventful. You're only really there to see Leatherface and him slash up some people. So if a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I'm going to give action two and a half stars. It is always cool to see Leatherface running with his chainsaw going after his victims. Call me in the movie, I'm going to give it one and a half star. I didn't Really attempt to any levels of humor and when there was humor it just didn't feel right or in place. Drama in the film I'm gonna give it one and a half star. I was not a fan of the story they told here, the way it played out, the way they also tried connecting the legacy characters with the new characters. 
everything about the story is really just a mess. Or in the film, I will give it three stars. They were gnarly kills in here. Leatherface is a threat and you feel his presence. Also, the fact that this was on Netflix and made for streaming, they did not censor the movie in any way, so they save all the blood and gore for you. Plus, with this director surprisingly having a good taste and vision for these visuals, that only enhances things. And suspense the movie, I'm gonna give it two stars. Like I said, with Leatherface actually feeling like a presence in this movie, you're scared for characters who are about to come in contact with them, but then you quickly remember, yeah, I don't even really like this person. Go ahead, Leatherface, do y'all think, cuz. Casual fans, I'll give it a B minus. Cinephiles, I'll give it a C plus. And critically, I'll give it an F. So for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I really gotta make an alternate version of my rating system for streaming movies. But if this film was playing in theaters and you had the choice, I still would say it's one you wait to rent. That'll do, donkey. That'll do. This isn't a horror movie you should go and watch right this second right now. It's one that if you have the time or if you're doing things around the house, play it in the background. But those are just my thoughts with Netflix's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I would not be surprised if they continue on with this. Horror movies on Netflix tend to do really well. There's probably a good chance Netflix might want another one. And there is a post credit scene, so stay for that. Everything and everything, be sure to like, subscribe, follow me on Twitter at 3C Films or on TikTok at 3C Films. But as always, I'm Chris. Take care.